Lord God, let your grace come. Spirit of God, in this moment, in this service of worship with these precious people, let your grace come to us. I pray, Lord, for those who are here who have not known your grace, they're hard-hearted, they've never repented of their sin, they've never trusted Jesus Christ. May your grace break through in this hour. And I pray, Lord, for the church family who know you, who um, have a thousand ways that their family's not what they wish it was and their life's not what they wish it was. Meet them in your grace. Meet them and let your grace restore them with peace and joy. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, don't sit down yet. Take a second. If you're related to one of the babies that was up here, go ahead and brag to the people around you. If not, at least greet the people around you and say hello to somebody. Hey, Nick. All right, you can be seated. And we'll read scripture today. Instead of reading from uh, the book of Hebrews, we're just taking one week off of that and we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a sermon about what your family needs and we're gonna have two texts one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. We're going to be in the book of Proverbs and then we're going to be in the book of Ephesians and we'll read this right now. So if you have your Bible uh, or if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in one of the seats in front of you. The book of Proverbs is kind of right in the middle of the Old Testament and the book of Ephesians is one of the epistles in the New Testament. So I'll give you a moment to turn there, help you find it. If, you, if you're not using this kind of Bible and you look up the Bible on your phone or something like that, I cannot help you. You've already crossed over to the dark side and your doom is sure. <laughs> so we're going to start in uh, the book of Proverbs. We'll read from Proverbs 1, the first seven verses, and then from Proverbs uh, 3, the first seven verses. Proverbs 1. This is a beautiful text. It says in Proverbs chapter one, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then Proverbs chapter three, also the first seven verses, a beautiful ode here to what, 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 what it would mean to be filled with grace and wisdom and truth. Proverbs chapter three, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success, both in the sight of God and with man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not, not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your produce. And then we'll read from Ephesians chapter four, the first three verses of the chapter and then the last 
three or four verses of the chapter, reading from Ephesians chapter four, verse one. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then picking it up in verse 29 of Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 29 says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace, grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So this morning, from these two texts, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, I want to tell you what and help you see what your family needs. This is a simple sermon with three simple points about what your family needs, and it's simple in the sense that it's easy to understand. But even though it's easy to understand, it's profound in the sense that if you, if you really, if you really take this in and it actually influences your own conduct and attitude in your relationships, it has the potential to change everything in the relationships around you. So three things that your family needs. Point number one, your family needs... Point number one, your family needs to understand that your family is not all important. It's kind of a strange first point right out of the gate. Let me repeat it. Your family needs to understand that your family is not all important. So a little different, on, especially on this morning when we have these beautiful families up here and they pray for their kids and we all dedicate to be a family together and care for each other. But the first thing to say in this biblical presentation about the family and what your family needs is this. Your family needs to understand that your family is not all important. The Bible says more than once or twice or three times that family is important and God ordained family and he counts it as important. But let it be known, the Bible says more than once, twice, three or four times, the Bible says your family is not all important. It's actually good for God to sometimes take what you have placed on a pedestal. God doesn't damage it because God's good. But God takes what you've placed on a pedestal and takes it off of that pedestal. It's actually good for God to pop bubbles that are artificially inflated by our own wishes and dreams because the priorities that we set for ourselves based on our own wishes and dreams, I wish you could understand this, the priorities that you set for yourself based on your own wishes and desires and dreams are not gonna end up with you as happy and as fulfilled as if you let God order the direction and priority of your life. Your family is important, but your family needs to understand that it's not all important. We can see this. You don't have to turn there from one place in the Old Testament. In the beginning of the Old Testament, Genesis 1, and the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew 28. We're going to go from creation to new creation from the made world in Genesis 1 to the remade world in Matthew 28, from the world first set in motion in Genesis 1 
to the, to the ruined world, resurrected and set into new creation motion in Matthew 28. You'll recognize this from Genesis 1. The Lord God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 28. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue do it and have dominion over all the earth. That's Genesis 1, the beginning of the Old Testament, the creation. Now listen to Matthew 28, the beginning of the New Testament, the inauguration of the new creation, and listen to how it's be fruitful and multiply, but it's totally different from earthly families. It says in Matthew 28, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even even to the end of the age. Genesis 1, Old Testament, first creation mandate. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Matthew 28, beginning of the New Testament, new creation mandate. God says, be fruitful and multiply. Not by making families. Be fruitful and multiply, rather, by filling the earth with baptized believers, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who have been taught how to observe everything that Jesus has taught. So I simply want you to see in the relative importance of things, and you understand this intuitively, that first creation concept, get married and have babies and be fruitful. You know, anyone can do that. You don't have to be a Christian to do that. But the new creation mandate, join the family of the church and be fruitful and multiply by making and training disciples into all the earth. See, for that, you have to be born again. But for that, you don't have to be married with children. You see the difference between the two. Family is important in an earthly way, but making disciples and being fruitful in the family of God is important in a way that transcends the geographic boundaries of the earth and in a way that transcends this tiny little time that we call this life. It matters eternally. You see, our earthly families are not forever families. Your family's important, but it's not all important. It's not gonna last forever. When we get to heaven, we will be in our forever family. And actually, it brings us sorrow. It causes us to pray and weep. Currently, for some of us, somebody in our temporary earthly family is not headed with us to our eternal family. But our eternal family is all of those who have been adopted by God the Father, sealed by God the Spirit, and joined in, in forever union with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Our forever family is those who will gather together and they will literally spend forever, day after day, if we have days up there, rejoicing in the fact that they have been adopted into the family of God and they belong to Jesus. That's what we'll do in heaven. And actually, it's you also know this is true for some of us. There are some people in your forever family that are sitting right here in this, in this sanctuary right now. There are people in your forever family who even right now, during this little span of time on earth, you're closer to them than you are to your earthly family because you worship Jesus together. Which is to say, if you are single... If you are a woman who has never had children, 
If you are uh, divorced, widowed, or single for whatever reason, hear me. You are in no way disadvantaged when it comes to fulfilling your belonging and your purpose in the forever family of God. In no way are you disadvantaged. In fact, if I wanted to argue about it, I would turn to 1 Corinthians 7 and a couple places in the book of Acts and actually make a biblical argument that you have a leg up of advantage on those who are burdened by temporary earthly families. You're not disadvantaged in the mission and vision of what matters for the eternal family of God. I noticed this last Sunday. I, if you missed last Sunday night, you missed it. The Crosswalk kids were all up here on this platform, all the grades, and they, they quoted scripture and they sang songs. So they showed us, they showed us videos. They, they highlighted the special needs classroom where we can really, in, in, in a way that's kind of... Um, cost intensive as far as the cost of, of human persons and workers, like really care for these kids that have special needs. It was a, a wonderful introduction to our crosswalk ministry. And um, I just noticed so much that night. I noticed the kids up here, one of the scriptures that they read and then sang was from Revelation chapter four and five, where it says, when we get to heaven and we see God, our father, he will wipe every tear from our eye. And I, I looked at those kids up here because I, I don't know all of them, but I know some of their stories. Some of the kids up here, their dad, little kids, and their dad has died. Their mom has died. Or maybe even worse, their dad walked out on them, left them alone. And these kids are learning and singing. I have a father in heaven, and one day soon, I'm gonna, he's gonna hold me in his arms and wipe every tear from my eye. Another thing that I noticed last Sunday in the crosswalk program was uh, the, um, so many of the workers who were highlighted on the videos on the screen and so many even of the, of the people that were working with them up here and making sure they didn't fall off the platform and all of that, they were single people, single people. Or older married people who uh, their kids are long gone. Maybe they're in Christ, maybe they're not. But every one of them now has kids who count on them, who rely on them, who love them, who watch their example. Your earthly family is in many ways not, not all important. So many opportunities to celebrate what it means to be a part of the family of God in a multi-generational church. So many blessings. One more thing that happened last Sunday night, I just share it to you because it's still gnawing at my, at my brain. Like I, I was up here, I think at the end, I closed in prayer and then I just came up here and I was giving all the kids high five and they're walking off the stage. And one little kid, I think maybe he was six years old, he gave me five, big smile, looked up in my eyes and he said, good to see you, Pastor Brennan. <laughs> That's what he says. And I mention it because to this moment, it is irking me because I don't know, I don't know if A, that little kid knew exactly who I was and chose to be sarcastic, but used his youthful innocence to keep him from, from, from me, like blaming him on that, or if he really was an innocent child that made an innocent mistake. I, I can't figure out which one it was. I wish I could go back and figure it out, but sadly I can't. <laughs> Your family's not all important. The family of God, of course, the sweet spot, the sweet spot, of course, is when God answers your prayer and in his overwhelming mercy, your temporary earthly family becomes part of your forever family, worshiping Jesus together. The sweet spot is when you can make and train disciples not only with the church, but also in your home. It doesn't always happen, but that's what we want to see. That's what we pray for. A little example for, uh, from my family, because this just happened yesterday. Uh, it's, a, it's a good example, but 
don't worry, I'll use myself as a negative example in this sermon too. This happens to be a good example. I was, uh, a family member told me something really encouraging yesterday. You ever, I didn't feel discouraged. You ever, you're not feeling discouraged, you're just kind of feeling normal. But then someone tells you something encouraging and that lifts you so high that you realize, wow, I needed to hear that more than I thought I did. I was talking with a family member yesterday and it's out of the blue, we weren't even talking about this, but out of the blue, this family member told me, you know, can I tell you something? I was like, yeah. This family member said, uh, I just want you to know, I think I'm a lot more like Jesus because you're in my life. And I, I just felt, I felt so overwhelmed by that. Like I said, I don't mention that because I'm a perfect example in my family, far from it. I just mention that because if there's somebody in your family and you are more like Jesus because of them, maybe they need you to tell them that. If there's someone in your forever family in the church and you're more like Jesus because of their influence in your life, maybe you need to tell them that. And know maybe about it for sure. If you are in family relationships, either in your own family or in the church, you need to be all about helping those people with whom you are in relationship become more like Jesus. That's the first point. Your family needs to know that it's not all important. Second point, very simple. Your family needs you to be humble. I told you it was simple. Your family needs you to be humble. Proverbs chapter one, verse seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs chapter three, verse seven. Be not wise. Proverbs is all about being wise. And yet Proverbs three, seven says, be not wise, be not wise. It says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. The single distinguishing characteristic between the wise person and the fool is that the fool is wise in his or her own eyes. They're not humble. The, 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 the distinguishing mark of a spirit-filled believer, of a person who fears the Lord, is this. They have a humble receptivity to the teaching of Scripture. They have a humble receptivity to a relationship with God and the teaching of the word of God. Your family needs you to be humble and teachable. This is, this is so simple and so blunt, but the church of God needs to hear it said. Listen, if your family is in a dozen ways messed up, your family is in trouble, you are in turmoil and conflict, if your family is in turmoil and conflict and you are humble and open to receiving the teaching of God's word, you will be all right. I'm not saying everything will be fixed, but I'm saying you'll be all right. The spirit of God will be with you and however crushing the difficulties are, they will not crush you. You will be knocked down, but not knocked out. But if your family, hear me, if your family is in turmoil and conflict and you yourself are unteachable, defensive, and hard-hearted, your troubles will go from bad to worse and your destruction could very possibly become irrecoverable. This is the determining factor. Are you humble or are you proud Proverbs 3, verse 7 says, be not wise in your own eyes, which leads to this, you know, contemporary proverbial aphorism. Your tendency to be wise in your own eyes is inversely related to the amount of wisdom you actually have. Your tendency to be wise in your own eyes is inversely related it's the amount of wisdom that you actually possess. Nobody left to themselves, no woman listening to herself becomes a wise woman of God. Never gonna happen. 
You have to listen to God. We are all born with our fingers in our ears. We are all born with an inner defense attorney that we just, we are all born coated with Teflon and everything. It's not my problem. It's your problem. There are a thousand reasons why. And it's the spirit of God, the fear of the Lord that breaks through and turns a hard-hearted defensive person into a teachable, receptive, humble believer. This is what you need. The Bible will forever step on your toes. And the reason why the Bible steps on your toes is because your legs and your feet and your toes are hurtling you off of a cliff at 100 miles an hour as you use your supposed free will. The Bible has to step on your toes to keep you from destroying yourself. The book of Proverbs in particular, every day that you read it, it will disagree with you. And the reason the Bible disagrees with you is so that you can become the you that you would want to be if you had a clue of what the universe really is. Your family needs you to be humble. You need to be humble before the word of God. That's our first point. We're not off of it yet, that your family wants you to be humble. I just want you to add a couple of words after the word humble. From Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, walk worthy. And then Ephesians 4, verse 2 says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So your family needs you to be humble. And in addition to that, your family needs you to be humble and then add some of those words from Ephesians 4, verse 2. Your family needs you to be humble and gentle and patient and forbearing, or especially what it says there, bearing with one another in love. That makes for a peaceful family if we can bear with one another without going at each other. Your family needs you to be humble and gentle and forbearing. Those words, humility and gentleness and forbearance, they are not hard to understand. They're easy to understand. Problem is they're hard to do. And so we make the classic Christian move of pretending that they're hard to understand because we can understand them perfectly, but we don't want to admit we understand them because that would require humbling myself and changing. Or we do the other kind of personal psychological move where, oh, yeah, yeah, that's easy to understand. But you see, I myself, the exigencies of my situation and the specificities of all of my relationships absent me from having to take those things seriously. And we, as, if we're, as if we're in a place where the Bible doesn't apply to us. There's no such place. It's very simple, but it's very demanding. But it, it makes all the difference. How do you keep family conflicts from just becoming a conflagration? You see, like I did the videos of that, of that volcano in Hawaii, like cars parked on the street, the lava just comes like no more cars, no more nothing. You, you, you're in that family conflict. How do you keep the volcano from just destroying and burning everything to death? This, this is how. Humility, forbearance, gentleness, being filled with the Spirit is being humble and gentle and forbearing in your family. It's like, I don't know why in Christian church world, we're like, if we're filled with the Spirit, we'll do miracles of healings or speaking in tongue or whatever. And God's like, would you get off of that already? If you were filled with the Spirit, you would be kind and humble to your family members for 48 hours in a row. And God's like, I've never seen you do that. I don't need you to heal somebody. Like, being, this is what being filled with the Spirit is. It's being forbearing and patient no matter how they treat you. Man, I hit this in my own family. Last, 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 last Saturday, I uh, had a conversation, a rather uh, loud and hot conversation with a family member. And I, 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 I stand by to this day that what I said in that conversation was true. And what I said in that conversation might even possibly have been helpful. <laughs> but, but it wasn't. Because in the moment, though I was speaking truth that could have potentially been helpful, the I, the me that was speaking was a problem because I was angry 
And I'm telling you, my communicational motivation was not, I love this person and I want to help them. My communicational motivation was, I am so right and I am so angry and I want everyone in the world to know about it. And it just kind of discounted whatever help they could have gotten from their supposedly godly family member. So I went back and apologized. And, um, you know, saying I'm sorry is not enough. Saying I didn't mean to say that's not enough. The right way to apologize as a Christian is to say, you know, I said and did things that I should not have said and done, but I did those things because I am a sinner. And I failed God and I failed you. I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? We need a lot more humility in our relationships, in our family relationships in particular. Your family needs you to be humble. Well, that personally negative illustration leads me to the third point. And the third point is this. Your family needs you to speak with grace and truth. And we'll add one more word and forgiveness. Number three is your family needs you to speak with grace and truth. We'll get that from Proverbs 3. And then we'll find the word forgiveness in Ephesians 4. Your family needs you to speak with grace and truth first, with grace and truth. This comes from the beautiful couplet in Proverbs 3. Actually, Proverbs 3 is a couplet of couplets. The second one is where it says, you will find favor and good success both with God and man. What is that? Verse 5 of Proverbs chapter 3. Um, Verse four, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. That's the second couplet. The first couplet is in verse three. Let not these two things, this couplet of things, leave when you speak. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Write them on the tablet of your heart and so you'll find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. So to have that blessing in the relationship with God and relationship with man, we need to speak with grace and truth. Or you could, you could put synonyms there with mercy and faithfulness. Or you could put the synonyms with gentleness and with direct truthfulness. So you speak the hard truth, but you speak it with a compassionate and gracious personality. And this is where we've got to get to. So to talk to the men, the fathers, the dads, the pastors of this church, the elders of this church, the ABF leaders of this church. Some of you are uh, never gentle, gracious, harsh to just lay down the truth. We have to be gracious when we speak the truth. And yet the flip side, some of the fathers in this congregation, you're plenty gentle, plenty gentle, but you never stand up for anything in your family. When's the last time you were like, no, God's word says this, so our family's got to do this. Like, stand for it with truthfulness and faithfulness. We're always missing on one side or the other. But your family needs you to speak with grace and truth. What a blessing. What better way to be just like Jesus who was filled with grace and truth? And just imagine with me, just imagine with me if every family in this church was led by a man who just like Jesus was was always dead center in the truth of God's word but always delivered that in a relational, gentle, lowly, spirited context of of belonging and forgiving. Imagine what those kids end up just just intuiting about their parents. They know that their parents are serious about God's commandments. And those kids also know that their parents are so serious about God's grace that if they, if the kid knows, if I blow those commandments 1,288 times, if I'm willing to repent, if I'm willing to come back, there's a grace and there's a forgiveness there. There's, this is so important to have both of these things together, not just in our families, but in our church relationships, right? For you to be the kind of church member, the kind of ABF member who can go beyond just just providing a casserole, though that is a ministry, 
and can get into some relational dynamics where you can say to another ABF member, hey, can I ask you about something? Are you struggling with this? And talk things through you, that you have that relational trust through graciousness where they're willing to admit their failures, but you have that truth right alongside of it. Your family needs you to speak with grace and truth. And then one more word on point three, your family needs you to speak with grace and truth and forgiveness. Verse 29 of, or verse 32 of Hebrews chapter four. Listen, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. The as clause is very important there in Ephesians 4, 29. Forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. So let me just ask you if you have seen this same strange crazy, mythical creature that I have, like Sasquatch, like a unicorn. It's an anomaly that shouldn't exist. And yet what's crazy is this animal, which should be extinct, it's actually repopulating at such a rate that it's becoming one of the most commonly seen creatures in the church. And this is bizarre because this animal, sh it shouldn't even exist. It should be a figment of imagination that you never see. And yet my, my, my weeks and my months pastoring, I keep running into this creature time after time again. Who is it? What is this mythical creature of which I speak? It is the unforgiving Christian. The unforgiving Christian. The Christian, the Christian, open parenthesis, definition, one who has been forgiven by Jesus Christ, close parenthesis, the Christian who is unforgiving, the one who has received forgiveness and grace, who then on a personal, familial, or church level seems personally implacably incapable of forgiving and sharing that grace with his or her earthly family or with his or her forever family in the church. This fractures families. I see it not out there in, I see it fracture families in here and beloved, this ought not to be. Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. As the blood of God, the Son of God has forgiven you. Is it really the case that the blood of Jesus Christ is weaker than the grudge that you hold? Impossible! Is it really the case that the blood of Jesus Christ is weaker than the calcified, embittered patterns that your family communicates in? That is possible if your family's not a Christian family, but if your family is in Christ, that is impossible. This is the application of the atonement. This is Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 are about relationships and family. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 are this glorious exposition of the gospel. This is the application of the atonement of Jesus Christ in our real life relationships where it really matters. This is the reason that Jesus died on the cross, stayed in the cold tomb for only three days, then rose again and ascended to heaven was so that he could pour out the spirit. And the evidence that we have received the spirit is not that we come to church on Sunday morning, the evidence that we have received the Spirit is that we conduct ourselves in our families with all humility and gentleness and patience and we bear with one another and we forgive one another and we love one another. That's it. That's gospel truth. Love makes the gospel go around and the same love can heal any family. Love makes the gospel go around. This is the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that when we believe in him, we'd no longer perish in hell, but we would have eternal life. Lo this is, the Bible says in 1 John 4, God is love. 
And it doesn't let us fill in whatever love is as if Paul McCartney and the Beatles taught us what love is. First John 4 says, this is love that God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. This is God's love. And so the way, this, the way this works is that you need God's love in your family. And this is how it works in the gospel. The golden rule's like not even enough. The golden rule, if you lead your family by the golden rule, uh, you're getting there, but you're not there yet. <laughs> the golden rule is do to others as you would have them do to you. Many of us teach that to our children. This is okay. But the gospel rule, gospel love, says not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Gospel love enables this. I can now do unto others as has been done to me by God in Jesus Christ. This, this is the gospel move so that I have received this grace, this love, this forgiveness, this lavish mercy so now I can give to others out of this overflow that Jesus himself has provided me with. This is a gospel call for all those here who have not yet received this gospel. Let the love of God save you not only from the wrath of God, but from yourself and your sin and receive the love of God in Jesus Christ. And this is a gospel call to every one of our Christian families and singles. Let the love of God in the gospel transform your relationships so that you live it out with grace and peace. Let's pray. As we bow for prayer, let me lead you in two distinct prayers. If you are not a Christian, you don't regularly pray, you haven't surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, let me just encourage you to pray and say, God, there's a lot I don't understand. And God, there are many ways that I have failed. But God, this morning I understand this, that Jesus Christ is the Savior who died for sinners. God, I'm a sinner and I want, I need that Savior. Would you give me faith? Would you give me hope? Would you change my life and save me through the gospel? And let me lead you in prayer if you are already a believer. Would you simply say, oh God, you have forgiven me so much. God, just laser out all of the unforgiveness in my heart. Say, God, I... I get so tangled up when I listen to myself. It's so easy for me to be wise in my own eyes. God, in prayer and in the light of your word, I confess that I'm a fool and I need your wisdom. Help me to walk out of here listening to your word. Father, hear your children as they pray, hearing forgive hearing have mercy and hearing seal by your Holy Spirit into the blessing of a walk of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's good to hear the word of God together, lift up our hearts to God together in prayer. Let me ask you to stand for the benediction. The benediction this morning is a psalm of blessing upon our families. It's from Psalm 128, a very ancient prayer of blessing to the family of families in Israel or in the church of God. It says in Psalm 128, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. 
You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children like olive shoots all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children in blessing. Peace be upon Israel. Amen.